and welcome to LGI2 Live. I'm Helen Olson and with me today are representatives from the government's three web super sites. Our conversation today is going to centre around the potential for online services to help the public sector make ends meet in these difficult times. Since the coalition government took office in May, there's been a wave of tough announcements for the public sector. Cuts, cuts and more cuts expected in the autumn. However, a citizen and business still need access to services. So with me today to investigate just how far a shift to online services could help our four leading authorities on online services. Gentlemen, perhaps you could introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm Bob Gann. I'm Head of Strategy for NHS Choices. I'm Alan Banks and I'm the Managing Director for Northern Europe for Adobe Systems. Good morning, I'm Guy Kerr from DirectGov and I'm the uh, Director of Publishing. Good morning, I'm David Dinsdale. I'm the Programme Director of the Business.gov programme, which includes businesslink.gov.uk. Thank you. In recent years, there's been a marked trend accompanied with significant investment and many successes towards delivering services via cheaper online channels. However, the COI's report last week highlights just how difficult it is to get a control and clarity over the creation and cost effectiveness of government websites. For example, the report shows the super sites attracting some serious traffic on an annual basis, DirectGov gets over 143 million visits a year, NHS Choices over 98 million, and Business Link almost 17 million. But are those numbers appropriate to compare when you look at the pool of citizen who may go to NHS Choices or DirectGov, or businesses going to Business Link? So is this a fair comparison? In fact, David, I think Business Link was highlighted in media reports as being the second highest cost per visit website, £2.15 per visit. Do you agree with that figure and do you feel that's a fair measure to be taking? Uh, yes, well, firstly, let me say uh, we welcome the, the Cabinet Office report. Um, in terms of is it a fair measure, we agree. It is a, it is a fair measure, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, so within businesslink.gov.uk, um, the investments that are made um, and, and the monies that are spent um, are there to generate benefits to business. And a, a, a key point here is our business case is predicated on uh, achieving those benefits to business. Uh, in the year in question, uh, we delivered over £800 million worth of benefits to business, a return of over £22 for every pound invested. Um, so looking at the rationale for the investment in Business Link's case, we do believe it was a very good investment. And how are you measuring that benefit? Is that through customer surveys or...? Yeah, the benefit is measured. We do a, uh, a survey every six months. We speak to about uh, 8,000 businesses and we do a, uh, a detailed 30-minute questionnaire with about 1,000 businesses. Um, and in, those, uh, in that survey, we ask businesses, did you use the service? Was it helpful? Um, and how did it help you? Um, and those are the results that come from that survey. Thank you. Bob, I think you've had some, some, also you've had some work done with NHS Choices, because I think there's a headline 22p cost per visitor. I think you've got some perhaps more valuable or more relevant figures that you could give us here. Yes, we have. We, um, we did some uh, uh, work recently with a, an independent piece of research by Imperial College in London, and that uh, surveyed around 4,000 patients who'd used NHS Choices and uh, around a third of those patients said that using self-care information on NHS Choices meant that they didn't need to see their GP. And uh, the COI report, 22p a visit to NHS Choices, costs about £40 to the nation for a patient to go and see a GP. So if you could just quickly tally that up for me, what would be the cost then per month, do you reckon, from people going to N NHS Choices rather than going to their GP? Well, the Imperial College research worked that out for us. Um, the public health analysts there estimated that if you projected that sample to the full user base of NHS Choices, you'd be saving the country around £40 million a year in avoided GP consultations, improving the experience for patients, but also enabling GPs to concentrate on the uh, conditions that are more serious and more important. And, and GPs say they see many cases in, in, in general practice where it would have been entirely appropriate for the patient to look after themselves with some um, good advice that, that they mm. could rely and trust. So for £40 million a year savings just, just in that um, mm. particular study. Alan, do you, from the commercial world experience or providing, uh, supplying uh, super sites like this, what how do you feel it is possible to, to measure? Are these 
direct comparisons like the Cabinet Office helpful or do we need to look further at well, I think they're helpful just in terms of understanding the cost of each of the services, but um, the, the true measure is going to be around the benefit that's delivered to uh, the organisations that deploy those services. Um, and increasingly, um, it's not qualitative benefit that you're looking at, it's quantitative benefit. So I think you know both um, Bob and David uh, very explicitly outlined you know, the, uh, the alternative cost of, of their particular channel. You know, it was £40 or £22, and the, the cost is pence in terms of the, uh, the delivery of that service. And that's the true measure. Sure. Guy, how many, you've, got, you've got an enormous amount of information on DirectGov, an enormous amount of services. Do you have any ideas of the valuation of the cost of delivering this via more traditional routes? Um, it's a good question. I mean, the overall you know, uh, figure which uh, the uh, report alluded to of 140 million people visiting DirectGov, you know, we wouldn't take that as the sort of measure of our success or not. What we would measure much more is the number of people successfully completing transactions, successfully finding the information they wanted. And those are the kind of uh, measures which enable you to take the opportunities to switch services online. And that is therefore the, the enabling role of direct gov. So, um, so in convergence mode. Well, it's, 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 it's being, giving the government the choice of being able to um, opt for online delivery over other much more expensive means of delivery. And I think that is where we would see ourselves as an enabler. But you know, per se, um, the, the digital delivery isn't saving money, it's enabling government to make the choices which will save money. So the COI report's an interesting starting point, but it's not the whole picture. I think it's a very good starting point, and, and obviously, you know, in, in today's environment, everyone's trying to be as open as possible about the real costs of services, so that, that's a good thing, I think. Okay. Um, research from Socketon that was published in March in their Better Connected report, it suggests that local authority website usage is on the rise, 21% last year, and a growing trend. So there is a, a trend as the, natural, as the general population and businesses are naturally turning to the web or alternative channels these days. But the Better Connected report does conclude that most council websites are not yet ready to support this major shift to self-service that perhaps is the, the end goal at the moment. Can a shift to online services mitigate the budgetary pressure on the public sector? David, do you think that's Yeah, very, I think very similar to, to Guy. Um, there, there is no doubt that delivering services online um, is a very convenient way for people to access services and relative to other um, uh, delivery channels such as phone and face-to-face, -face, um, it is substantially cheaper. Um, but I think it's for the service designers to work out what the appropriate mix is of people who should still be able to access services face-to-face -face, um, and via the phone and, uh, and online. I mean, just to jump in there, you know, the, 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 the local, um, local councils and, and the kind of services they, they might or might not deliver online, um, you know, it's really up to them to make those informed choices. However, I do think that, uh, you know, the evidence shows that the people are looking actively for online solutions. You know, when, the, when there were the blizzards earlier this year, a lot of people were logging on early in the morning to try and find out, you know, whether schools were closed, whether the roads were closed. So there is a kind of an active demand from the people to find out essential things at a local level and a central level, but online. So it's, it's not just government thinking of what it can deliver out. It's a two-way street. People are very actively seeking that uh, information and those services. Have we got some general figures or examples? Um, Alan, have you got examples of our web services provably more cost effective? Uh, absolutely they are and uh, I think a lot of the um, innovation in recent times has actually come out of the local government sector as well. And uh, you know, just a couple of uh, examples. Firstly, um, Southwark um, Council have, uh, have implemented a one-touch one government service. And the objective of that was to have a single interaction with a citizen <coughs> and cross-sell, if you like, multiple services. So from your bin to your council tax to your housing benefit, etc. And so the first thing is you had to engage the end user in a service that um, allowed them to conduct multiple transactions in a single contact. And that's the initial essence of cost saving. Um, because if you can do that, then you're, you, you're immediately saving money. And then to move those citizens away from face-to-face -face transactions, which is the most important and costly uh, way of doing it, uh, to 
online to call center transactions, which is the next lowest cost way, to online transactions and eventually to mobile transactions, and to provide a single consistent experience from mobile through to face-to-face -face transaction. All of those are key in terms of monetizing and turning these services into real benefit. And in Southwark's case, you know, they uh, now process housing benefits um, in a, uh, in, in down to an average of four days, but sometimes a single day from an average of uh, 26 days and a maximum of, thir of, of 38 days. You know, they're, they're, they're delivering real benefit and they are cross-selling these services and delivering multiple services in a single transaction. And so, they, you know, benefits are explicitly measurable and, uh, and, and cost savings are explicitly measurable as well. You picked up an important point there, in improving the citizen experience. I mean, I think that's quite a big focus of DirectGov, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, we can't um, sit here and say, you know, just if you put things online, the citizen experience is necessarily better. A lot of work has to go on um, behind the scenes to make that um, transaction, you know, usable, um, useful. If it's usable and useful, it will, it will be used. And I think that that is increasingly the benchmark of, of how we collectively are measuring our success is, you know, really looking at the customer and the customer insight and focusing on how people react in this world and how they use this, uh, these kind of services and then designing the services that, that are appropriate for those needs. It's not just online services, is it? It's the mobile. Like, there's a very good mobile app. You, you use mobile in terms of reminders, which is another way of digital, which saving money on the, for the NHS. That's right. I mean, the, the, a major cost to the National Health Service is um, what we call DNAs, and the health service did not attend. You know, people who had an appointment, they didn't turn up for that appointment. So wasted resource, clinicians sitting around, um, wasting time, very, very expensive uh, to the National Health Service. A number of local NHS organisations have introduced simple SMS text reminders uh, just to say to, to people, you know, don't forget, you've got, you've got an a, a appointment coming up, turn up for that. And evaluation of those initiatives has suggested a, up to 30% improvement in, in the take-up of, of, of attendance at, 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 um, at, at consultation. So a very simple technology and a very positive benefit for the National Health Service. And, and in those kind of examples, you know, the work that the NHS Choices d does there, you know, is of huge interest to, to direct government, I'm sure, to Business Link, because there's lots of other kind of reminder services that also apply in other areas of government, where if you can get people to do their, you know, their think about their tax early and, you know, you can streamline the procedures. So there's a lot of uh, interest in, in that kind of pilot, which, which is going sure. on. We've got a first of our audience polls now. So um, the first one is a very simple question. Online services, will they help the public sector maintain service quality whilst reducing costs? Yes or no? And we'll come back to the answers later. In the moment, I just want to move on to um, Socrates Research also highlighted the, the cost of failed website visits where the information wasn't found. They estimated it was around 11 million per month, which does suggest you know, significant scope for improvement there. But is it reasonable to expect all councils to develop transactional services for all their services? Or is this where, for example, the super sites can help? David, you've done the point of single contact, which I've uh, spoken to you before about this one, which is perhaps a very good one. Perhaps you could outline that to us here. Yeah, sure. Um, the point of single contact, just a, a brief uh, bit of history, um, is a project that came out of the EU um, and one of the things that the EU recognised is that service businesses were not setting up and migrating around Europe um, in the same way um, and as quickly as other businesses that, that trade internationally. And so a, an initiative was created based on the EU services directive to say, well, we think one of the barriers here is the number of formalities, the number of things a business has to do when it sets up in a different country. Um, and so the, e the EU mandated that there should be a single place where someone could go to set up a business um, and do all of the things that they needed to do in order to set that business up. Um, a key part of that, obviously, um, are the licenses and permits that are required from uh, local government. And so uh, within Business Link, um, and working closely with the Department for Business, business representative bodies and, and local councils, local authorities, um, we set up the point of single contact, which is um, a, an online portal where a business can go, they can set up the business, they can understand what licenses they need. Um, so in terms of responding to the, to the questions, 
Um, central services, I do think, can play um, a strong role uh, in helping councils uh, fulfill their obligations, the point of single contact being key. Um, I think a little bit later we'll talk about syndication uh, as well. We've got a, an audience question on that, but before we move on to that, though, with, with the EU Services Directive, you developed the forms that yes. the businesses can use, and that's available for the local authorities to use. And I think, believe, was it, it was developed in uh, Adobe Lifecycle, so they're customizable, these forms, they can back end integrate, the local authorities can choose at what level they use the central development, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the basic form is the start of 85% of all business processes. And the, 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 the trick is that you have a form which is intelligent, validates data that goes in to make sure it's correct, helps guide the user through the experience. They can use it online or offline. And then when they submit that form, it connects to the business processes and automates those business processes, takes the data out, puts it in your back office systems, or even pre-populates those forms um, prior to the user getting them to help them through that experience. And all of that is to fit in with the user's lifestyle and also to, to, to make the, uh, the experience that much, uh, that much cleaner and uh, to compel them to use the online services as opposed to face-to-face -face services. But the Point of single contact then. So these forms, the local authority can choose to back end integrate if they want to, they don't have to, but the options there, the work's being done. With, um, for example, quite topical tax, the VAT is likely to, is, ra is rising. Do local authorities have to change all of their own forms or can you do that for them? Well, th this is, a, I think, a, a key point of, uh, of these kind of pieces of central infrastructure is as things change, the central team will maintain those key changes. Um, but that doesn't take away the control from the local authorities in terms of the ability to customize the information they need for a particular form. So you have elements that are, that are controlled centrally, such as, as VAT rates, etc., and then localized elements uh, so that the council can deploy services that match uh, the needs in, the, in their particular uh, circumstances. We've had a question coming from the audience from Adam Kerfoot Roberts at Rochdale. Uh, will Direct Govern Business Link be offering syndicated services along the lines that NHS Direct has been doing, NHS Choices, sorry. So, Guy, could you just tell us a bit about your syndication pilot and then um, let's hear from you guys. Yeah, NHS Choices has been uh, syndicating content for some time now. We have um, about 300 uh, signed up syndication partners and they range from big organisations like AOL, Boots, through... Um, patient organisation websites, the NHS and quite a number of local authorities now. And we think it's extremely important that uh, NHS Choices doesn't need to be your destination. If you choose to use high quality NHS content in another setting, we're happy that you do that. The important thing is the content and the confidence that comes in the NHS uh, branding but we allow you to access that where that's convenient for you. And it's been a very successful initiative and I think uh, an area we'll do more and more on. Well, I mean, the uh, <coughs> Direct Gov has, has um, started a, uh, a pilot where we've uh, put all our data, all our information onto um, an Innovate website, which uh, is, is you know, available to, to, the, uh, to the development community. And we've got, I think, over 100 signed up partners in the, in the first uh, couple of weeks of use. I mean, very encouragingly, a lot of those partners are, you know, local newspapers, um, uh, local organizations which have got particular um, expertise in different areas of service delivery. So the content that we provide is obviously of interest to a lot of people, which obviously sort of validates the, 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 the overall principle of it. But certainly, as long as we can um, maintain the, the direct gov authenticity about the, the validity of the content, the fact that other people are using it and using content in their own way is, a, is extremely uh, beneficial to the, to the community. Yeah, and for, uh, from Business Link's side, you know, we're very enthusiastic about syndication. About a quarter of Business Link's um, traffic comes from syndicated services. Um, one of the areas that we're looking at uh, this year is how can we make those syndicated services more flexible? Um, again, similar to um, DirectGov and NHS Choices, our approach is we want to get the content to the people where they will consume it um, rather than necessarily say, oh, you have to come on to businesslink.gov.uk to consume that content. Of course, the benefit, though, is that people who are taking that content can be assured that you've got vast teams making sure that the content is, well, in, in NHS case, clinically correct. 
Yes, I mean, particularly in the area of health information, you know, everyone will appreciate. You go onto the internet, search for a, <coughs> excuse me, a health topic, um, you'll find an enormous number of, of potential sites. Many of those will be inaccurate, confusing, maybe clinically dangerous. So extremely important for us that all the content is clinically assured, it, it comes with that confidence and wherever you see that and you see the NHS uh, badge on that you can be assured of the clinical quality of the content. You may then uh, choose to access that in other places but at least you can do that with, with confidence. I believe you also have uh, commenting widgets as well don't you? So we do, I mean a, a major feature of, of NHS choices in, in the time that we've been running the service is enabling uh, patients to comment on the services that they've accessed. So. Uh, we've uh, provided that opportunity for hospitals for over three years now, uh, for GP practices since uh, October, and by the end of this year, there'll be the opportunity to comment on all health services. Um, just uh, fairly shortly going to extend it to dentists and then on to other services by the end of the year. Now, many people will come to choices to leave those comments. Others may uh, be using maternity services and be using something like Mumsnet or Netmums. So we're developing a, a, a commenting widget that can sit on all those other sites. So that syndication is then a two-way process. It's not just us pushing out content, it's us listening to the public through those partners. So it, it, certainly with our audience today, so things like social care information and self-help those things would also be available as con syndicated content. Yes, with I mean, uh, uh, audience, I, I, I understand particularly from local government, we, we have, I think, 70 local government partners and they're taking uh, particularly social care, carers' content, but also, again, service directories. So, yes, that, that syndication opportunity is very much open to local government as well. Guy, David? Well, the, the, I mean, the premise that um, you know, we're trying to get information to where the people need it is all, ab is all about the, uh, you know, the, the current thinking. I would just take issue with you know, what you said about you know, vast teams of people. I mean, overall, DirectGov, what, what, what we do have is excellent relations into government. So we have the uh, means to make sure that the information coming to us is valid and authentic. It's not, it's not that we're kind of... Um, reinventing the wheel at all, you know, we are dispersing it as the, as the principal means of, of dispersal and then hopefully as this syndication thing takes hold, more and more people will start to, 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 to appreciate the value of it and use it in their own different ways. Yeah, and, and you know, similarly on business, businesslink.gov.uk, uh, what businesses are looking for is authoritative guidance that they can trust. Um, and so it is important whether people are viewing the guidance on Business Link or viewing it on uh, someone else's site that they understand that it's official, it's current, it's up to date, and that if they follow that guidance, um, they will comply with uh, whatever regulations are, uh, they are complying with. We've just got our second poll, if we could just put that through, is um, taking syndicated services from another public sector site will help my organisation provide more services whilst reducing costs, yes or no? And I think that does lead us on nicely to branding, actually, because that seems to be a fairly key part to this. It's uh, the level of trust. Um, Alan, what do you think? How, how important is it from the commercial world or from the citizen to have trust in the information that's coming from these sites? <coughs> well, I think it depends on your brand. And um, clearly the, uh, the audience today is a government audience, and one of the key attributes of that brand is going to be trust. Um, but brand is the thing that draws people to your offering in the first place. You know, why do they go to NHS Choices? Why do they go to Business Link? There has to be a reason and, uh, and some values that underpin that. I think Adobe's uh, experience is probably a, a little bit more in how you engage people once they've actually been, uh, been drawn to that, uh, that site. But, you know, brand's key um, because people need to identify the service you're providing with, um, with, uh, with, with a problem that they've got. I mean, there is a danger in not achieving, not achieving the switch, the savings expected by not engaging people in the switch to services. But I think uh, one of the bigger problems as well is this dropout of people during the process. I mean, how can branding and awareness help you deliver the right services? Well, I think there's a couple of ways. You know, for, first of all, the um, brand, uh, you know, represents uh, investment in, in a kind of recognised and recognisable 
um, destination point, and, and that you know, obviously offers government a big opportunity to save money, so you don't have to kind of create new marketing campaigns the whole time. You can, you can have recognized uh, digital destinations where people can access that or indeed recognize that information as um, authentic and authoritative. But certainly, you know, th there is also the, the, you know, the reality that is that a lot of people um, just find their information via a search engine direct. They, they're, they're not looking necessarily for the brand at all. They're just looking for the information. But at some stage when they get to that information, they have to be uh, um, given the assurance that what they've found is of value and, and is trustworthy. And that's where I think we would all kind of have a, a, you know, a, a synergy in, in how we regard it. We don't want to create you know, a monolithic um, uh, idea of super sites. And, you know, I'm personally against the, uh, the term super site because I think it kind of denote, denotes all the wrong um, implications. But what we are is trying to uh, create, um, uh, you know, a uh, repository of um, authenticity which can then be dispersed out. So, you know, that's very much how I think the modern population is using all services. They like them where they want them, but they still want to know that when they've got it, it's of the value they expect. How much of a part of the costs, David, is, um, is, is actually making sure that everything is checked and the, con the content is correct? It's a, it's a very important part of what we do for, for us. Um, I would say it probably consumes between a quarter and a, thir a third of our costs. So on businesslink.gov.uk, every single piece of content um, is checked, uh, worst case scenario, every year in order to make sure that the content is accurate, it's up to date, and it's providing the guidance that is needed. Um, so that, that whole uh, content maintenance program um, is a very important part of the service that we do and it's an area of uh, great efficiency as well for government. Bob, there's um, a behind the headlines which I rather like on the NHS Choices site. Um, tell me a bit more, bit more about that and the ideas behind yeah. it. Yeah, sure. Um, all of us read articles in the in the press you know, nearly every day about some miracle cure or some new, you know, it's either something is terribly bad for you or it's a miracle cure that's going to, um, you know, transform healthcare as we know it today. Um, and uh, we provide a service on NHS Choices called Behind the Headlines. And every day that takes an article that's been in, in the media that day and provides an analysis of uh, whether... Uh, it, it's based on good evidence, whether that's a story you should believe and take any notice of. And we know that it's a service that's not only valued by patients, but it's also actually valued by doctors and high street pharmacists because patients will go into the consultation, they will even over the counter in the pharmacy say, I've just read this article about this new miracle drug can I have it or, you know, is there, is, should I take any notice of this? And it's a very good example, I think, of trust that, you know, when, when, when people read an NHS analysis of that story, it's something they believe and, 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 and you know, it's something they know they can act on or, or, or not. Uh, so a very important part of, of what we do, and it's, it's just part of the service we're proud of. Can I just jump in there mm, as well? Please. Because also I think that that's a good example of topicality. Because mm. I think, you know, what, one of the aspects of, um, you know, being a respected and trusted brand is, is, you know, responding and talking about the things that people are talking about. You know, this is the digital world where people are talking about things in real time. Twitter conversations last five minutes, an hour, and then they're gone. So one has to be part of a, you know, a government interaction with the people which is maintaining a very current and very switched on view of the world. And, and that's, you know, that really does play to, to our agendas. And that's part of you know, the maintenance that, that um, David was talking about, that we have to reflect what's happening now. And, and that is one of the key ways that um, publishing has changed, really, in the, in the digital world, and, and probably one of the best opportunities for government. You do a lot of crowdsourcing, don't you, with some of your material? Well, we sir, I mean, the, the, the most you know, obvious example is, um, you know, we have a facility for everyone to, to comment on um, DirectGov uh, articles. So every single one of our 5,000 pages is commentable, and we're generating a huge amount of citizen interest. Um, I think at the moment we're running at uh, 40,000 ratings a week and 10,000 comments a week. So people out there are really keen to be able to say, yeah, that's a good service, but actually it could have been a bit better if you did that, or oh, we were a bit confused by that one. And if we use that kind of feedback, 
we can really improve what we do. And, and I think you know, this, is, this is the excitement of this world. It is a real opportunity to get things right. That's a huge, that's a huge liability, though, in terms of looking, the, the resourcing, of, looking, of dealing with all those comments. Do, you well, read, it, somebody reads every one? Well, absolutely. It's, it's a huge implication. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I wouldn't say it's a liability. It's a huge Sorry, responsibility a huge resource, and, yeah. and a huge resource potential implication. Obviously, you can you, you know, use technology to make things easier. But, you know, the government has opened up consultations to the, to the population. They are saying to the population, you know, would you like to comment on these policies, on these old laws, you know? And the, the amount of uh, response that's been generated indicates that people really do value this two-way relationship with government. It's not a broadcast world anymore. It's, it's an interactive world. And I think that that really is part of our responsibilities to... To, to fight for that value within within what we're doing. I think Guy brings up an excellent point there. It's all very well having trusted information if people don't want, you said interact and you spoke about relationships and you know our term for that is engagement. And so how do you engage people in the service that you provide and how do you look at the service you provide from um, a user-centric point, point of view? So from the user's point of view, and I think too often in the past, government services have been provided that expose the complexity of their back office applications and internal processes. And I think what you're, you're doing at uh, DirectGov is very much capturing the needs of the end user and responding to them and entering into a dialogue. And we're not in a broadcast world, it's an interactive world. And yeah. I'd like to applaud what you're doing. Well, I mean, it's, it's the usability function again, you know, to, to, to focus on, you know, the, the people who use your services and then understand how they use them. And you can very quickly get an idea from usability testing whether you're on the right track or completely off beam. This brings us on to a very nice question from the audience that's just come in, actually. A uh, very good question, but surely that's only for the IT literate members of the public? So inclusion, accessibility, well, usability. How far do we go down? I mean, with your audience, Bob, yeah. you must have a lot of inclusion issues. Yeah, I mean, cer certainly in health, um, the types of people who make the biggest use on the National Health Service, the people who cost the National Health Service the most, are older people, people with disabilities, people living with long-term conditions, exactly the population who are least likely be digitally included. Um, it's really important that as we develop digital services and realise the full potential of those services that we don't uh, disadvantage those citizens in, in accessing them. So important that we work with intermediaries such as public libraries, UK online centres, important that we look at other channels uh, in addition to the internet. And one of the reasons I don't like SuperSite, a bit like Guy, is it's not just about sites, it's not just about websites, it's about digital services that are delivered through a range of channels. So um, absolutely committed to that in NHS Choices, as I know uh, our partners in the other services are as well. Yeah, one, of the, one of the key aspects of that as well is that you know, it is very much the agenda of inclusion, making sure that whatever you do is um, able to be delivered in a, a way or within a choice uh, that um, includes everyone. And, you know, a lot of the, the younger generation now are far less kind of uh, literate in terms of obsessed by words than that we are. They're much more into pictorial um, pointers. They're much more into, you know, getting their information via uh, a sort of visual medium. So, again, you know, we are very much exploring how we can use video, how we can use relations with the social media, with uh, YouTube and so forth to get government messages into the right domains in the right context that people will go you know oh yes I'm interested in that but not because I've read it because I've you know I'm 19 and I saw it on the YouTube channel so it's really horses for courses it's and horses from for generation courses. yeah why three two yeah and it's to elaborate on what Bob was saying so it's it's different different mediums and different channels but also different types of content and again we have to remember the value of, of really well produced content in this whole discussion so it does come back to content and just feeding that through in different ways. Mm -hmm. Do you have as much of a problem with that in Business Link or are businesses more generally now with the IT literate? I think for many businesses that have started out, um, 
uh, already, um, most businesses are online. So uh, research from HMRC indicates that about 98% of businesses are online, so very high online population uh, usage there. Uh, but building on the, uh, the themes that we've been discussing, uh, I think there is perhaps a, an assumption that because we're online, running online services, that online is the answer for everything. Um, and that is clearly not the case. So as, as we discussed earlier, when it comes to designing services, online services are good for some things. Um, they are not good for other things. Um, so I think the onus again comes back to the people who are designing the service to say, right, what, what is the appropriate mix and who are the appropriate people for using these different services and to make sure that um, an appropriate service end-to-end, -end, whether it's online, call center, or face-to-face, -face, is available. I do think there's a... a <coughs> um, uh, a requirement of technology vendors to help you do that as well and it's not just about having stoved pipe services around you know call center services and face-to-face -face services and you know mobile and online services it's about the ability to engage in an experience across all of those devices so one minute I might be engaging on my um, intelligent mobile device the next I might be face-to-face -face, the next through the call center mm -hmm. and it's um, this customer experience which is key in using technology that facilitates the uh, automation of that experience across those different platforms. And a big problem for the public sector. I mean, obviously, they can help take help syndicate services from the, the main, sorry, super sites, major sites. Um, but also, they've, they, within their own websites and environments, they've got disparate systems that they need to link up. So there's a huge legacy of material, back office systems that need to be able to pull together. Can you offer them any help with that? Well, well, yes, and I, I think that's where the web um, provides a really interesting opportunity. Um, looking at the work that's gone on over the last few years with Business Link and Direct Gov around bringing government services into one place, um, if you access the services through Business Link and Direct Gov now, um, and for example, you go and you fill out your VAT return, and then you may do some apply for some licenses with the council. To the user, it appears like one seamless journey. Um, so you're using Business Link and then you, you're working with the HMRC systems. Um, but that is a coordinated journey. And so you're sheltering the person at the end who's, who's using the service from the underlying complexity of you know, uh, Business Link's technology services, HMRC's technology services, their local council's technology services. Um, and the web is fantastic. Um, and digital services are fantastic for doing that. Dari Gov has um, <coughs> you know, uh, um, links with many, many local government uh, councils, and um, I think about 400,000 people a month go on to direct gov, but actually go straight through with a couple of clicks to the local government service. So again, for, for, as far as they're concerned, it's, it's one, you know, one homogenous uh, uh, user journey, but um, it's actually you know, lots of different organizations interacting. And of, of course, you know, that, that kind of idea of the back-end machines all being talking to each other and being able to sort of you know, uh, integrate totally is something that we all aspire to. But in the meanwhile, and given the, you know, the, 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 the um, constraints of budget and everything else, we should really work on the incremental steps to improve people's lives in those kind of ways that we can do, as, as David said. So the, the platform independent technologies that can pull all this together and still shoot things off on mobile? Yep. So, um, you know, we're a three technology provider. We have artistic hearts, but we're a technology provider for uh, about sort of three, 3.6 billion. And our, our mission really is to help people engage with information and ideas. But, but effectively what we do is we provide a, a layer of abstraction between the complexity of the back office, the complexity of business processes, and the end user, and the ability to deploy a single seamless experience on uh, mobile devices, um, on PCs, on the internet, on uh, you know systems that allow call centers and face-to-face -face experiences. And it's about the integration and with your back office, the automation of processes and the ability to create these, this, this, this um, abstracted user-centric experience. A lot, of, a lot of money has been spent over the years with um, all organizations, councils, every department, every agency, they've all got their own online presence and their own brand. How important is their own individual brand, do you feel? Obviously, the, icon, the, the trusted environment of bringing in some content, is there a, a local environment where actually the, the local brand is more important than the trusted brand, or do they work together? Bob, do you can counter that much? Well, I, I think in the NHS, NHS organisations will want their own web presence where they just need to present themselves as a corporate entity, you know, an NHS trust 
has actually certain obligations to involve and inform the public in, in its business, and it will want to do that. And I think that's fine. What, what isn't sensible is having thousands of NHS and Department of Health websites essentially um, presenting public information content about clinical topics, about health promotion, about healthy lifestyles using services, etc. We believe a more effective way to address that issue is through uh, national sources of content and expertise and clinical assurance and then pushing that information out through distribution arrangements and enabling that to be surfaced locally where appropriate. So there's a, a national uh, economy of scale and quality assurance but a, a real diversity of local access and local distribution arrangements. It comes right to, to affordability very much though. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you know, <clears throat> in today's, uh, you know, climate, um, you know, the, the savings that you can make from having services um, kind of aggregated in, in a fewer places in terms of, you know, staffing, um, systems, uh, content maintenance, all that kind of thing are very considerable. And that's why, you know, the, the convergence of government websites onto DirectGo, I think we've done about 180 in the last 18 months or so, um, is so important because really for the citizen, that they don't really need to know so much, you know, is that service, you know, developed by this bit of government or that bit of government. They want to pay their car tax through a respected government portal and good night kind of thing. So, so it's very much trying to kind of remove that, uh, you know, that layer of um, complexity t to the citizen's life as well as, uh, or, you know, in behalf of uh, government efficiency. And there, there is also that onus on, on the, uh, us, on Business Link Direct Gov and NHS Choices. Um, so when we started down the road of developing um, the point of single contact, uh, we based it on the local Direct Gov application that had already been uh, uh, developed by Direct Gov. Uh, so we do reuse aspects of, uh, of each other's services as well. Before we move away from brand, because we keep coming back to complexity and brands and things, two polls for our two poll questions for our audience around brand. Slightly different questions. Establishing my organization's online brand is essential in delivering cost effective online services, yes or no, or is essential in creating a sense of place and community, yes or no. Brand is a a topic we could probably run and run on for the moment, but let's let's um let's move on to open data. Um, which also does link in with brand. There's a government and the public sector, in fact, local government are expected to put everything, every transaction above 500 pounds up on the websites. How can you help them there? Well, um, in, in the case of Business Link, one of the initiatives that we're working on on behalf of, uh, of the coalition um, is the publication of uh, all tender opportunities um, in the public sector above 10,000 pounds. Um, so we are developing a, uh, a capability which will be launched later this year uh, to do that. Uh, in terms of open data, one of the, the key aspects of that service is, as well as having an, an interface that people can use and go and search for information, we will also be publishing all of the data via the data.gov service. Uh, so people who want to take that information, uh, do analysis with it or build it into their own commercial applications will be able to do so. And I think it's those kind of central uh, functions that bring together um, information from uh, central and local government that can be very helpful in making the data uh, available rather than an individual person having to go around each individual uh, council or government department, et cetera, to collate the information in the first place. I mean, that's a good point because the corollary to open government, which is in, in here, open data, <clears throat> you know, if it's open but no one can find it, well, it, you've kind of gone in a, in a self-defeating circle. So I think what David's saying is very important. This is all part of the open government agenda. Let's not hide government processes, government expenditure, government um, finances, you know, government appointments. Let's not hide any of that. Let's be open about it. And then the citizens can make, you know, their informed choice about whether they're getting value for money and steer the debate. And that's, again part of this consultations process, which is so interesting, is that, you know, instead of kind of government deciding top down what things are going to happen, they're actually asked for feedback on what things might happen. And that that's part of the agenda, is, is helping that debate happen, helping them find the data to give them the, the opportunity. Can we just come back to the e-notification 
portal that you're talking about. You said yeah. over 10,000? Yes. Will that be extended to help local government in their over £500 requirement? Uh, is the £500 requirement a publication of expenditure? Of or expenditure, yeah. Um, the the e-noticing portal is specifically around tender opportunities, okay. so it's around services that will be procured um, as opposed to services that have been procured. You might not extend that at all to help them with the publishing of all their fi financial data. Yeah, it's not within our scope currently. Okay. Um, there was moving back onto the open data. The, obviously, this does create an opportunity for other people, the commercial sector, to come in and. and uh, reuse data, but there's all sorts of other opportunities. Like um, you did a, a World Cup app, Bob, which I thought was we did a, indeed, yes. an interesting choice. I mean, possibly that's something that may be picked up with the, by the commercial world, but I can see that there's a huge public benefit in engaging with a hard-to-reach audience here. Could you? Yeah, we, we we did a we did an app um, to coincide with the World Cup, which essentially was just a, a a fun game to engage, particularly young men who tend not to be very good at recognizing health problems and using health services in understanding their own health. And if they did some healthy activities like um, interactive tools or looking at videos or joining up with other people, they increased their transfer value. So it was, it was just a piece of fun. Um, got some very good media coverage um, on the radio this morning on the Today program and, and indeed in the press today, there's been some criticism of whether producing apps is an appropriate activity for government. Now, I would argue uh, that particular one was not particularly expensive in terms of a communication uh, activity. If it engaged some men in their health, it's, it's a worthwhile thing. But at the end of the day, maybe producing apps is not a core function of government. And we need to look mm -hmm. at what government does particularly well or uniquely well and what we may in future be able to leave to a more pluralist environment where there are more people involved. Central function of government is probably around um, sourcing, validating, clinically assuring, in, in our case, high quality data and high quality content. And there will be a, a wide range of, of other information experts who, who deliver that to the, to the public. I still think there's a key role for uh, an NHS website as a single place that people can go, but there's also a key role for, for other partners and for choice in, in that world. Do you see the commercial sector, Alan, taking up this opportunity? Um, I, I, I do, um, and they are. Um, so much of what the commercial sector is doing at the moment in terms of um, um, uh, sort of integration of data sources is is um, to do with pulling different parts of a business together t to create a new service. Um, so you know, investment banks will pull together the FX and the equities and other parts, of, and they'll create a real time experience which is exists on the client. Which is so it's a mashup, and uh, clearly there's opportunities for commercial uh, people to come in to provide unique services that add value to um, the disparate kind of government services, maybe to a unique audience. So where there's money to be made and people oh. are willing to pay, um, yes. then it will happen. But that could be the, the, the thorn in, in this because there's been, a, there's been a bit of an issue recently on some of the online um, debating forums about publishing data and uh, a company that has been publishing data on an exclusive right for councils and then charging subscriptions to access that data and making it exclusive. I, I think there are still you know, commercial issues here because can you make money if you're putting all the effort in, but actually, technically, if it's open data, you must allow the source data to be still accessible. I think if, if um, the principle is that if um, you are providing data to the development community or to the commercial world or whoever, and they come up with legitimate, uh, clever ways of um, adding value to the citizen's experience of that um, online service or that transaction, then that's, that's a legitimate business uh, need is, is being required. However, when they're just re sort of re-nosing it and charging for the privilege without adding any extra value, then we would say that that would be uh, potentially a problem. And indeed, we would you know, encourage people to, to, to not have to pay for what they can do for free in, in, you know, online with the government. 
So you will be trying to police this as well? Well, not police it, because again, you know, it's, it's not uh, you know, our job at all to act as police, but I think that, that again, that the beauty of, of the world that we live in is the people themselves will make the choices and will, will um, respond accordingly. If they see value in things, they will go with it, but if they, if they think that actually there's no added value but they're being charged extra, they will certainly let us know, and they have, and we are engaged in uh, the, the right conversations to, to steer that behaviour. We've got one more, uh, one final poll, because we keep coming back to transactional services. In fact, transactional services are where we're going to make the savings. Um, final poll, my organisation's website needs further investment in order to deliver, to deliver fully accessible cost-saving transactional services. Yes, modest investment, yes, significant investment, or no further investment needed, because money is going to be short from now on. We're looking where the super sites can help. Um, .gov labs. You all three of you are involved in .gov labs. Perhaps you could tell us a bit, a bit more about that. Who's well, .gov, I'll, I'll launch in. .gov labs is really a collaboration between the, the three, um, you know, uh, interests in this room um, in terms of the government. Because you know what we don't want to do is reinvent the wheel. We don't want to kind of be developing ideas, developing services, developing content that is you know, um, hidden away, we want to be able to share it with everyone. And that's the principle of .gov labs. It's a, it's, an, it's a sharing principle which I believe is now starting to kind of create um, enough uh, usage amongst the um, online community in government and in local government as well, so that people in local government are also getting the benefit of some of the ideas and thoughts developed. David, do you want to? Yeah, and you know, there, I think there are some really interesting initiatives. You know, some of the things that we looked at um, and that we're very keen on that are being taken forward are things like wikis. Um, you know, we provide a lot of information and guidance. How much of that information and guidance um, can be provided uh, by members of the public who wish to contribute to areas perhaps of best practice? Um, the, the kind of key facts about legislation will always need to come for government, but there are areas that, that, that touch on that. Um, so, you know, the ability to you know, work together um, and understand you know, what that means for government in, you know, in what areas are, are WIC is appropriate and what areas they're not, um, you know, is, is a key part of us developing the service. You've done a very interesting application that came out of this for A&E, I believe. Yeah, we, I think, think one, of the, one of my favourite .gov labs projects, and, and all of these projects were quite small scale. They had relevance across all three of our services, and also they were very open in terms of involving bright developers. We, we developed them through hack days. We got a lot of creativity going. My favorite is um, a real-time uh, dashboard where all the hospitals in Lincolnshire have worked with us to put up a, a, a tool where you can see a webcam and a, a, a number of hours you might have to wait in all the accident and emergency departments and walk-in centres in the county. Uh, so you as a citizen can see, well actually if I'm going to wait four hours there and two hours there, I'd go to that hospital. Or even more usefully, you might decide if I'm going to wait for four hours, maybe I didn't need to go to accident and emergency quite as much as I thought I did. And maybe make an appointment with my GP or some kind of self-care. And we're looking at other applications where information in real time where you have a choice of access points could be applied across other services. So simple things like which car park has the um, most availability of spaces, um, other public access settings where people might go as well. So there's a really nice small example, wide applicability and some creative agile development. So the concept can be rolled out Absolutely. Reused. Have you got any other examples? I'm afraid I've lost my link to the poll results, so I'm just waiting for those to come through. Um, but in the meantime, there's other things that I've, I've heard of coming out of the, the .gov labs based around webinars, um, social media. Yeah, David. so uh, you know, a good example was um, in a number of areas uh, in the businesses and health context, um, the, uh, the technology uh, now is good enough to allow uh, the concept of online advice. So you know, if you were doing a consultation uh, with someone, uh, how could you replace a face-to-face -face interaction with a, essentially a video conference over the web? Um, and so we looked at areas where um, 
you know, where that would work, you know, what were the technological limitations, uh, what were the limitations in terms of how people would like to use the service. So a key finding from that particular study, for example, was that for a first meeting, it was generally regarded as not really appropriate. Um, that you know, if you had a meeting with a particular advisor, particularly if you were going to then subsequently meet them again, the first meeting should be face to face. However, second and subsequent meetings, great, you know, it worked really well. Um, and so, you know, those sorts of findings are you know absolutely uh, crucial to us in terms of being able then to support organisations who are looking to deploy online services that use the, the Business Link Direct Govern NHS choices and say, well, actually, you know, based on our understanding, you know, if you're looking at online advisors, then our research would indicate that a level of face-to-face -face interaction is, is, is required in order to get the most out of the subsequent online interactions. Well, that's what, one of the reasons why I object to the word super sites, because actually, just to reiterate, you know, we are also doing the, the, a lot of developing of um, ideas and um, you know, best practice and skill sets and capabilities which we can share across government and across local government as well so that people aren't having to you know, reinvent the wheel the whole time. And that has got huge um, saving implication because the, you know, the kind of people that we're talking about, you know, they're high-end, expensive skills so you don't want to be kind of everyone doesn't want to be re-employing them a hundred times to, to, to get to the same answer. How, how accessible is this to local government, police, fire, health, local authorities? How, how easily can they get hold of this learning? Well the this um, learning? communities and local government who, who are the kind of key entry point for the um, local direct gov have got a very active community going in, of their own which is part, you know, starting to share some of this so I think it's a key aspect of, of what we are doing is to, is to reach out and, and, and disperse this knowledge. It may be that, you know, something that was developed in one setting is, is very applicable in another. You know, um, David talks about using online advisors for, um, for business advice. We've used a very similar approach for um, diabetic nurse advice for, for young people. And young people really like that environment. It's, it's improving the did not attend rates because it's much easier just to go online than it is to go to a physical consultation. So uh, uh, an approach that was developed uh, initially particularly for business advice, we've now been using for health advice uh, and, and the transferability has been very encouraging, I think. But the cost for that development was develop once, yep. use many times, uh, exactly, use across. That's exactly it. Um, and develop local months, use many times. And local authorities could hook into that mm -hmm. just as easily, yep. either through CLG yep. or can they contact you direct to ask these things? Well, it's meant to be direct gov, so why not? But no, it's uh, it's it's so, C C CLG is part of direct gov, so so you know very much very yeah. much part. Yeah. There's an interesting question that's just come in saying, uh, how do you engage the back office in the process, particularly in terms of interacting with the customer electronically? Um, actually, Alan, that might be one you might like to field first, as that's uh, your speciality. So, how do you engage the back office, the back office in, the in the process? So. Um, systems and people, I'm assuming this is. Yes, from, from a system standpoint, um, the ideal is that you abstract from the back office because local government in particular has uh, such a quagmire of, um, of applications uh, that um, the danger is as you expose some of the, uh, those services that they provide to the um, citizen, um, you end up with a very uh, unsophisticated and, and, and difficult to use experience for the, for, for the user. So first thing is make sure you have a level of abstraction. Second thing is I think make sure you're able to transact with those, those systems. And so, um, you know, if you're going to see the business process through, then the ability to load data into forms, uh, to, to put data into your back office systems through those forms and automate the processes is key. Um, you know, from a, 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 a people's standpoint, then um, I think the skills are, are available in most IT departments now. There's nothing that you should be using that isn't based on some pretty well understood uh, standards. So I don't think there's any special skills you'll need there. Do you think it's more of a, a, a people process at this point in getting people engaged with creating, for example, the forms for the single point of contact? They're intelligent yeah. forms, so they can guide people through things. Is it getting all that? content of the process and explaining it, is that? Yeah, I, th I think that's a key part and that the approach that we've taken on point of single contact is, is effectively in three levels um, depending on where 
uh, the particular local authority is. Um, so the first level, um, if a local authority has highly developed online services, is we will serv surface those online services through Business Link. Um, the second level um, is we will uh, effectively provide the forms for the local authority and send those, those forms through to the local authority effectively as an email. And the third level is where um, we will uh, take the forms, uh, provide the forms for the local authority um, and then send them directly into the local authority's transaction processing systems. Um, so I, I think, uh, again, picking up Alan's point of, of the fact that there are you know, many different approaches to providing online transactions, that engaging the back office requires uh, a, a set of approaches that can be tailored to the individual circumstances of a particular local authority. So the technology is not the problem anymore these days. Well, I think the problem. I mean, the technology is an issue, of course. But but the you know again, a lot of the time, you know, the citizen may not know at all um, where they are in terms of technology or you know um, delivery mechanism. As long as they've got a safe um, transaction going on, and as long as they know it to be a safe transaction, then that's all they need to know. So it's very much about how you make things presentable, how you surface them. Um, but I think that you know behind the scenes, the technology discussion has to be has to be uh, you know hard and, and sharp and efficient. There's uh, another interesting question that uh, takes that one step further because we have very much focused on web and mobile and web conferencing, etc. One thing we haven't touched on as a question is saying the panel does not refer to self-service telephony as a digital channel. Can I ask why? Evidence shows that the propensity to talk and drive end-to-end -end transactions is at least as high as web. Comment. Who would like to comment well, I on think that? I'll, I'll jump in and say that I think it's uh, you know an excellent question and and it's uh, you know a way, uh, an area of development in terms of uh, capability which is coming on fast. We, we've heard of stories of you know very very successful um, delivery via telephony, automated telephony, and I think it's something that we need to get our heads across uh, quite quite quickly. Is this something for do, for the uh, .gov labs? Well, it could well be. You know, of course, in health we have a, a very well developed. Um, telephone access front end to the NHS in NHS Direct. Many people don't really understand the difference between NHS Direct and NHS Choices and, and indeed during the, the panel at least one person referred to my service as NHS Direct so clearly there is quite a bit of public confusion there. We need to be working much more to bring those channels together so that they can work uh, as a single integrated um, front end to the service. NHS Direct is uh, currently a, a, you know, an actual telephone conversation, but I know they are looking at automated telephony options and we'll be looking forward to working with them on that. Yeah, and, uh, Centrally within government, uh, there's a, uh, a team set up called the, the Contact Council, which is looking at con contact centres across the piece. Um, and we're now hooked in, uh, Business Link Direct Govern NHS Choices, to that work to make sure that the services that we provide do make sense um, as you follow them through to the contact centre. Um, and I, I agree with the points uh, made by the rest of the panel. You know, self-service uh, telephony um, is, a, is a great way of delivering services where appropriate. Excellent. Well, I've got the, the poll results in. So uh, the first poll is online services will they help, public sector, help the public sector to maintain service quality whilst reducing costs. 100% yes, that's no great surprise. I think we did think that one. Um, taking syndicated services from another public sector site will help my organisation to provide more services whilst reducing development costs. 94% said yes. So uh, just 6% said no, which is probably worth looking at those 6%. Perhaps we could contact you later. Um, however, the poll three is branding. This is the two questions on branding. Online brand is essential in delivering cost-effective online services. 63% said yes. Online brand is essential in creating a sense of place and community, and that's higher, that's 75%. So I think that's a, an interesting discrepancy there in, on the cost and also whether actually community is, has a value of its own that's not quite so uh, bottom line. The last poll is... Um, about whether you need further investment. So does your website need further investment in order to deliver fully accessible cost-saving transa cost transactional services? 82% of you say yes, significant. 11% said modest. So I don't think anybody is quite there yet or anyone's pretending that um, it's going to be easy. So investment will be needed. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, 
thank you to my guests, to Bob Gann, Alan Banks, Guy Kerr, and David Finstaff. Our next programme, next month's programme, is going to look further at local government websites. So we're going to be talking to Soccer Tim in more depth about their Better Connected programme and just look at where this investment in local government sites is needed. Um, I do hope you'll be able to join us then, and thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.